Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to a webinar brought to you by Merck. Um, today, we're covering the topic of innovations in chemical synthesis. Um, long title here, Continuous Flow, Electrochemistry and Catalysis. Before we get into it, and again, welcome for joining us. Uh, before we get into it, we're just going to run through a few housekeeping slides. So just for the record, this webinar is being recorded. So we will um, reach out to you after the webinar and provide you with the link where this is so you can watch this at another time. Um, your cameras and your microphones are currently muted and will remain, will remain muted actually. But there is an option in the chat where you can ask questions to our speakers. So please, as the webinar progresses, uh, feel free to ask a question to each of our speakers. Uh, we'll make time to ask the questions to our speakers after each of their talks. And also, we'll have a Q and A session uh, at the end of each speak at the end of the speakers' talks as well. Um, post event um, on your way out, there will be um, when you do click on leave, uh, there will be some questions for you to to respond to if you have the time to. We'll, we'll appreciate that because that's you giving us a gift, telling us what you think and how we can make things better in the future. And also, again, post event, um, we'll be reaching out to you with a, a series of of links and information related to, to this webinar and more. So again, uh, thank you for joining us this morning and we we'll hope you do um, enjoy our, the next hour and a bit of your day. Um, so our three speakers today are Dr. Lara Mullins from ANU, uh, Dr. Anastasios Polizos uh, from Melbourne Uni and Professor Philip Chan from Monash Uni. Um, I'm the person here in the middle, I'm your moderator, John Ronyotis uh, from Merck. I'm the Field Applications Specialist Lead. Uh, Justin Peters is our marketing specialist. He'll also be a moderator and be asking the questions to, to the speakers. And Karen Duong, um, she's our chemistry application specialist. And um, Karen is always, always available to speak to you really about anything chemistry um, that, that you like. So um, these are the six people you'll either hear from today and, and in the future as well. So the agenda looks like this. I'm speaking now and just gonna, this is the first five minutes. Um, Right after me, we'll have Dr. Lara Mullins um, uh, talking about exploring the potential of electro-bio-organic synthesis. Um, then we'll have, uh, again, Dr. Nastasius Polizos, or Tash as he also likes to be called, um, followed by Professor Philip Chan for his, for his session as well. And again, the last 10 minutes of the session, we'll have it as a QA. and a um, So firstly, and I'm gonna throw to Lara. So here's Lara, again, uh, Lara comes out of the Research School of Chemistry. Um, out of ANU, in, out of ANU in our nation's capital. She is from America, so you'll, you'll hear a bit of a, uh, an American twang when she speaks. Um, and her topic again is exploring the potential of electro bioorganic synthesis. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'm going to pass over to Lara. She'll take over for the next 20 minutes. So over to you, Lara. Thanks for that, John. I'll just go ahead and get my slides up. All right, and hopefully you all can see that. All right. So thanks very much, John, for that kind introduction. And it's really a privilege to be able to present to you today. Um, I'm coming to you virtually from the ANU, as John mentioned, in Canberra. And I've chosen this really fantastic photo of Canberra on a gorgeous autumn day. This is consistent with our annual autumn balloon festival uh, in celebration of Canberra Day. So this is our, our chemistry building, and actually my office is just here at the corner. Uh, so if I'm really lucky, I can kind of crane my neck and look out uh, and see all of these balloons floating over the sky. Uh, of course, Canberra isn't always known for its fantastic weather, and many of you will know that um, you know, we get a bit cold in the winter, but perhaps most relevant to today's talk, I've chosen this uh, very electrified photo, which was also taken just outside of the Research School of Chemistry, uh, and features the main protagonist of the story that I'm going to tell you today, and that is electricity. So my group has become increasingly interested in using electrochemistry to functionalize biomolecules. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work in that area today. So it begins with the group's interest more broadly in peptides and proteins as interesting biological agents. So nature, of course, modifies peptides and proteins in really weird and wonderful ways through uh, enzymatic processes. As synthetic organic chemists, we try our best to mimic nature's ability to precisely modify peptides using chemical tools. 
So we're interested in, for example, modifying a single amino acid within the context of a larger polypeptide or forming complex macrocycles, so topologically interesting peptides. Uh, and we're also interested in sort of protein synthesis, labeling, and bioconjugation. And a lot of our rationale for pursuing these important areas of research is just thinking about the importance of peptides and proteins as uh, a component of the global pharmaceutical market. So you'll notice that peptides in particular have a, a pretty modest share at the moment, only about 5% of this $1.2 trillion market. But the important point that I want to make here is that peptide drug approvals are increasing. So the rate at which peptide drugs are being approved uh, is increasing substantially. And what that means is that it really puts uh, you know, the, the impetus on synthetic chemists to be able to develop new tools and strategies for modifying peptides to make them more drug-like. And that's really the space that we like to play in uh, as a research group. Fundamentally, we are synthetic chemists, we're organic chemists, and we're interested in developing methodologies. So I like to term these late stage peptide modifications as being our ideal um, you know, goal in the pursuit of novel synthetic strategies. And the concept is simple. You take native amino acids and you use chemistry, which allows you at the very last step of the synthesis to install a variety of different modifications. So the divergent nature of this type of chemistry really allows you to take advantage of the ability to generate analogs, for example, for drug discovery uh, in, in a rapid manner. So we're interested in developing these types of tools and we see unprotected peptides as sort of the ultimate proving ground for synthetic methods. The methods need to be tolerant of all of the diverse functionality present in a native peptide, the 20 canonical amino acids, and ideally be tolerant of aqueous conditions. So they're really stringent requirements, uh, but we think it provides um, keen motivation for innovation in synthetic chemistry, which is sort of the topic, of course, of today's webinar. So how does our story involve electricity? Well, thinking back on the last decade or so of synthetic organic chemistry, there's been a really interesting trend toward the use of synthetic electro-organic chemistry to carry out chemical transformations. And there are a number of reasons why this might be the case, but one that I'd like to highlight is really the simplicity of the process. And I show here just a simple electrochemical cell. Really, you're adding or removing electrons from a substrate, and, and that's how you're carrying out these types of transformations. You don't require chemical oxidants or reductants. You can do this chemistry using the simple movement of electrons. And it's really the driving force or the tunability of this type of chemistry, which makes it incredibly attractive. So you can control the potential, right, the driving force at which you carry out these reactions, and you can tune that potential, sort of dial it in, if you will, to match the functional group or the functionality that you're trying to react. So the inherent tunability of electrochemistry is, is really attractive. It's also inherently safe, scalable, and sustainable in comparison to lots of chemical methods. So as a way to sort of represent this, I pulled out a case study from the recent literature. In 2019, the, the Barron Lab at Scripps published a modification to conventional birch reduction chemistry. And it was an electrochemical approach to carrying out the reduction of, of aromatic substrates, such as the one shown here. I won't go through all the details of the chemistry. It's really a fantastic read if you have the time. But what I want to point out is that this electrochemical reduction avoids some of the challenges associated with scalability safety and sustainability of conventional birch reductions, namely sodium metal, right, pyrophoric metal, liquid ammonia, and cryogenic temperatures, which make it really difficult to scale up birch reduction type processes. So electrochemistry offers a really nice alternative in this case. I should also point out that the development of the field has been benefited by the availability of commercial reactors. So this Ica Electrosyn is just one example but you can now sort of plug and play with electrochemical transformations. Admittedly, my group had very little experience in electrochemistry when we first started our journey in this area, but we were able to just take an instrument out of the package, sort of plug in electrodes and, and give it a go. So the barrier to entry of the field has also been lowered, which was really um, made it possible for, for groups and a variety of different practitioners to utilize synthetic electrochemistry. So for us, we became really interested, of course, in whether or not we could apply electrochemistry to so-called bioorganic molecules, right? The small molecule community absolutely, I think, is increasingly recognizing the value of electroorganic synthesis, but 
peptide and protein chemists have, have been relatively slower to adopt the methodology. So utilizing this, this tool for late stage peptide modifications is incredibly underexplored, but of course still offers all of those advantages in principle that you can access for small molecule chemistry. So this is where we really delved into the field. And to step back for a second, um, of course, we have to be realistic, right, about the challenges associated with applying electrochemistries to such large and complex molecules. So it's an underexplored area, but in, in general, there, there are a few reasons that you can immediately point to as to why that might be the case. And it, it does boil down really to the diverse functionality present in peptides and proteins. I've highlighted here just a few amino acids that might compose your peptide or polypeptide chain and their associated potentials under various electrochemical conditions. I don't show this to be diagnostic in terms of the exact potential that you would need to apply to modify one of these residues, but show this more as a representation so that you can appreciate the variety of redox active motifs within a peptide. So not only do you need residue specificity, you also have to contend with the fact that any given peptide or protein might have multiple copies of each of these residues. So there's a residue specificity and there's a site specificity. Can you hone in, for example, on a single tryptophan in the presence of a number of other tryptophan residues within the sequence? And that's a tough challenge. So truthfully, we cheated a bit in first getting into uh, electro-bioorganic chemistry by targeting the termini of the peptide as appropriate positions for functionalization. So there's only one N terminus to a peptide and one C terminus to a peptide. And we thought perhaps we could develop methods which allow us to functionalize the C terminal position of a peptide in a robust manner. That would allow us to really control not only uh, the chemoselectivity, but also the, the site specificity of the transformation, being that there's only one option for reactivity. Thankfully, there are a number of really interesting C-terminally modified peptides that we were uh, interested in pursuing the synthesis of anyway. Um, so it was a really nice merger of these two ideas. So the first target that I'm gonna tell you about was our, our synthesis of bisiocyanamide C, which has an interesting thiazole motif here at the C-terminus. It's a cytotoxic peptide and has some interesting biological applications. The second class of molecules are these so-called designer alpha amides, so I show here luprolide, it's a blockbuster anti-cancer drug, and it has a really simple N-ethyl modification here at the C-terminus. Now, as a synthetic organic chemist, you might be looking at these molecules and say, hey, that looks pretty easy to make, right? All you have to do is, is form an amide bond between your amine and a carboxylic acid. So I think the answer to that is yes and no, right? If you were to take conventional uh, methods to make these types of, of substrates, amide bond forming chemistry, for example, to synthesize this natural product, the C, there's a, a sort of hidden secret uh, that is often overlooked in the field when you carry out these types of transformations. And that's when under conventional activation conditions, standard amide bond forming reactions, you get a huge loss of alpha chirality at this position, penultimate to the thiazole. So this is sort of an untold secret uh, of peptide chemistry, a century old and often overlooked challenge. So I won't go through the mechanism of how this process occurs, but in general, when you activate your carboxylic acid in the presence of base, you're likely to scramble the stereochemistry upon these types of couplings. So this makes C-terminal modifications, while ostensibly simple, really challenging when it comes to things like drug discovery. You can imagine that if you have a mixture of epimers at a single site within your chain, it becomes really problematic to separate these uh, motifs. And when you're thinking about developing therapeutics, they need to be, of course, highly pure and homogeneous in order to deconvolute the biological activity uh, of your compounds. So this is a challenge which needs to be overcome. An alternative conceptual approach is to think about rather than breaking an amide bond, can you break a carbon-carbon bond? And retrosynthetically, that gets you back to sort of a, you know, standard linear peptide with a C-terminal carboxylic acid. In the forward sense, you think about carrying out a late stage decarboxylative aerolation. So you decarboxylate and you forge that new carbon-carbon bond. 
I should note that, that this type of concept has been explored in the literature. So some really fantastic methodology from the Barron Lab has looked at nickel catalyzed decarboxylated cross coupling approaches uh, published several years ago. Uh, and a photochemical variant of this type of transformation has been uh, at play and work by the Macmillan group. So we were interested in expanding upon this concept and also developing some new chemistry in the process. And that led us to some early work published by the Zeebok group, so back in the late 80s, where they used electrochemistry to carry out uh, a similar decarboxylative uh, motif, um, but a two-electron oxidation that gets you to an aminium intermediate. So how does this work? Well, you take your carboxylic acid in the presence of base, it'll deprotonate, and it'll undergo initially a single electron oxidation, which triggers a decarboxylation. The radicals so formed in this process can undergo an additional oxidation to derive the aminium. And Zeebok carried out these reactions in alcohol-based solvents, which leads to the formation of this so-called N-O-acetal. And the acetal is a really special intermediate because it can be used to generate on demand the aminium. So it allows you to regenerate this highly uh, activated electrophile and whilst turning off your electrochemical oxidation, right, you stop the current flow, throwing in a nucleophile which might otherwise be incompatible with the electrochemical conditions. So this process allows you to derive various C-terminal functionality. And we wondered whether or not we could explore further this, this uh, seminal work and whether or not we could apply it to larger substrates. So could we take full length peptides, for example, those which are consistent with natural product like scaffolds, and carry out a selective electrochemical oxidation followed by an aerolation type reaction. The advantages we thought would be quite substantial. You don't have to preactivate your acid. You don't have to use expensive catalysts and no toxic reagents are required. So let's have a look about at the development of this type of chemistry and, and how we went about it in the lab. We started off really simply. So just taking an amino acid and alcohol a base here to deprotonate our alcohol, and it also serves to form our electrolyte in situ. And we electrolyze this mixture at 8 milliamperes, a constant current reaction, in an undivided cell, very simple, with a graphite anode and graphite cathode. So, so this mixture indeed allows us to derive our NO acetal. And we were really interested, of course, in the functionalization of the NO acetals. So our initial, initial test reactions looked at utilizing the acetals in a friedel crafts type aerolation. Under these reaction conditions, the acid serves to generate that reactive aminium. And the electron-rich aromatic, of course, can react uh, in a friedel crafts type approach to generate your aerolated variant. Thinking about this mechanism, of course, the ability to form the aminium is heavily dependent on the leaving group ability of this alcohol-based functionality. So we had sort of predicted from the outset that we might see a difference in overall yield of this two-step process based on what alcohol we're using in the electrolysis conditions. And indeed, that was the case. And we found that by and large, that decreasing pKa, so increasing leaving group ability, led to higher yields of the overall transformation. And this tended to be the case for the variety of different alcohols and acids screened. I should note out there's one exception to this sort of predicted reactivity trend in relation to overall yield, and that's when you really soup up the leaving group ability of that, of that alcohol group, you run into competitive hydrolysis as a side pathway. So I mention that because I want you to keep that tucked away in your brain. It'll come back uh, in a couple of slides. So what can we do with this chemistry? Well, I won't bore you with all the details, but we're able to derive a variety of different simple amino acid variants using different nucleophiles. And of course, we can apply this to peptides. So we can take our um, carboxylic acid peptide and in a late stage approach, we can electrolyze using very similar conditions to those that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, and then we can uh, react that acetal with various nucleophiles. And we've been able to extend this not only to sort of tetrapeptide examples, but also to natural product variants of uh, the bisiochianiamides, which has been a really exciting, I think, exploration of how we can apply this chemistry in a real world system. So I mentioned that you needed to keep that hydrolysis byproduct sort of tucked away in your brain. Well, we saw that pathway actually despite being problematic in the formation of our aerolated natural products and associated analogs, 
we saw this hydrolysis pathway as, as a really interesting byproduct. And the student that I had working on this chemistry was a bit frustrated that she kept isolating these truncated peptides. Um, but when we finished the overall aim of, of our initial study, the aerylation chemistry, we took a step back and started to wonder whether or not these types of amide byproducts might actually be valuable in the synthesis of some really useful designer alpha amides. And so we had a, a spin-off, I suppose, of the initial project where we could utilize the same electrochemistry, oxidative decarboxylation, uh, and then thought to actually diversify this acetal intermediate through a hydrolysis pathway. That enables us to derive these secondary amide products. And again, you might be thinking about this, well, you could just do an amide coupling to synthesize that, that molecule. And we did. And as before, you see scrambling of that alpha chirality using standard, really stock and standard tried and true coupling reagents. It's almost unavoidable that you're going to scramble that stereochemistry. So this oxidation hydrolysis pathway avoids activation and stereochemical scrambling completely of that valine residue. And we thought that this would be quite advantageous moving forward. We also hoped that we could utilize this acetal as a really valuable intermediate. So you can imagine, rather than hydrolyzing the acetal, going through a reduction process. So taking a silane and a Lewis acid, you can reduce the acetal, and now you can derive tertiary amides from a very, very common uh, similar intermediate. So in practice, what does this chemistry look like? I show just one example here, given the, the limited time that we have today to discuss it. But we were able to synthesize a variety of different modified peptides. Here I show the cyclopropylglycine variant as an illustrative example. And we can electrolyze this peptide. We generate our key acetal intermediate. And we can hydrolyze this variant using acid and water. So we're forcibly hydrolyzing. We're optimizing the byproduct, if you will. And that allows us to derive this really interesting secondary amide. Alternatively, we can take the reductive conditions. We proceed through the same electrolysis. And then we treat that intermediate with our reductant. And now we can derive this N-methyl and cyclopropyl methyl variant uh, in good yields over the two steps. So these types of variants would be really difficult to synthesize using amide coupling, not only due to scrambling of stereochemistry, but also due to the steric bulk of the amine that would be required for this transformation. So we think this is a nice alternative approach to modified amides. A real quick snapshot of the substrate scope. We can, of course, take advantage of inherent chirality in amino acids. So we can derive amides with stereocenters, for example, hydroxyproline and isoleucine. We can take unnatural but commercially available amino acids and utilize these to incorporate interesting functionality at the C terminus. And we found that the chemistry was remarkably functional group tolerant. So we can take free acids on the side chains. Polar groups like arginine are all tolerated. And we can even synthesize variants like this lysine-derived peptide, which could be interesting for biological applications. So a quick snapshot of all of the fun things that we've been able to do with it, aside from simple substrate scope. We can deuterate peptides using borodeuteride reduction. We can access some interesting natural product scaffolds, uh, as well as some therapeutic drug leads that have been published in the literature. And we were even able to apply this to luprolide in an efficient synthesis of luprolide and various analogs. Very, very pleased to find that our synthetic material, you can see this UPLC injection peak, lined up pretty much perfectly with the commercial sample of the luprolide that we were able to purchase. So we think that this electrochemical method is really a viable approach to the generation of new therapies. So what does the future outlook look like for electrobioorganic synthesis? Well, as noted before, there is this challenge of tunability. And we got around that initially by utilizing the C-terminus as our target. There, there's only a single C-terminal motif. You can deprotonate it, and it can generate a stabilized aminium. So, so it's really special in the context of peptide functionality. But there are ways to exploit electrochemistry for residue-specific modifications that do allow for targeted sidechain modification. One recent example from the Gowan group in 2018 utilized a very, very low potential to selectively oxidize uh, a small molecule reagent. The in situ generation of an active um, triazoline dione reagent, in this case, allows for tyrosine specific functionalization. So it's a nice example of how you can pair small molecule activation with protein and peptide functionalization. 
The final example that I want to highlight is something from very, very recently, the Barron Lab in 2021 discussed this concept of rapid alternating polarity, which is where you use an alternating rather than a direct current, and that allowed them to achieve remarkable chemoselectivity on a highly functionalized peptide. So this is a, a really, really interesting area that remains to be more fully explored in the context of peptides and proteins, but really offers exciting prospects for electro-bioorganic synthesis. So I'd like to wrap it up there with an acknowledgement of my, my group. Uh, Yu Tong Lin is the exceptional electrochemist in my group. So all of the chemistry that you saw today was carried out by her. Uh, and I'd like to thank, of course, the, the remainder of the group, uh, technical support and funding, uh, as well as John and the Merck team for the invitation to present today. And I'm very happy to take questions at the end in our Q&A session. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lara. Thanks so much, Lara. Just quickly, I've noticed a question in the chat from Gary. So, Lara, I don't know if you can see the chat, but the question is how functional group tolerance is a method. Uh, are native amino acid side chains tolerated? So. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. So, um, in general, most of the native functional groups are tolerated, um, but you can actually tune the selectivity to a large extent by playing around with electrolyte and pH conditions. So, for example, uh, an amine, which might be oxidizable, can be protonated, uh, and that essentially inhibits that oxidative process. So there's a lot of unique tricks that you can play around with to bias the reaction in your favor. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Lara. And also, just quickly, I noticed um, you mentioned the, the Lectrosyn platform, and Merck has got a new product called Syn Lectro, which is coming out soon, which is a scale up from that in the preparative scale. So it's good that yeah, multiple companies are making it easier, I guess, for electrochemistry to be, I don't know, consistent, reproducible, and, and advanced in the lab. So good to see. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be very interested to try the uh, the new platform from Merck as well, Justin. Thanks for that tip. Got to, got to spruce some products sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No problem. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lara. Okay, and next you. speech is uh, Tash. So if you want to share your screen. Thanks, Tash. Okay, there we go. I'll just bring up my laser pointer. Okay, Justin, can you see that? All right, brilliant. Okay, well, thanks very much, Justin, uh, for the kind introduction and, and great to see the, the work that's coming out of Lara's laboratory. Um, today, I'll be talking to you about some of the work that we'll be doing in our laboratory, and that's focused around visible light photo redox catalysis how we marry that to flow chemistry to, to innovate some new bond forming reactions. And very similar to, to Lara, we have, we have an interest in, in amide bond forming reactions, and I'll be talking about those to you today. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the hard work of these three individuals who has gone into developing this chemistry. Um, they've worked tirelessly throughout the, the pandemic and even before that to, to um, to generate the chemistry that I'll be talking about today. So Jose is a graduate student in our laboratory. He's just about to finish up with his PhD. Uh, Nenad was a PhD student at the time, and now he's working for Dulux. Uh, and Milena is a postdoctoral fellow in our group, um, who's currently still with us. All right, so our group has an interest in developing new methods for organic chemistry and looking at some challenging uh, and existing challenges in organic synthesis. Uh, we're very interested in aspects of CH activation chemistry uh, and also interested in developing new methods for um, bond forming processes using photoredox catalysis. Photoredox catalysis, of course, has bloomed over the last 10 or so years uh, and, and has made some serious advances into, into the practice of organic chemistry. What we uh, identified and were attracted to uh, with photoredox catalysis many years ago uh, was the fact that you could actually undertake um, or develop many chemistries under mild reaction, very low catalyst loading. Uh, it also allows to take the tunability of these catalysts, and here are some examples I've shown at the top here, and, and use their redox potentials to address uh, you know, oxidation and, and reduction processes to, 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 to generate new bond forming processes. Of course, that means now we can start addressing new um, ways to generate radicals and look at how these can be uh, transitioned to new processes. Uh, and you can also um, address new transition metal and organic catalytic reactions uh, using these using, um, techniques. Now, the way that this chemistry works is that we take any of these catalysts, they can be organic catalyst, organocatalysts, 
transition makes trans transition uh, metal based catalysts such as the ruthenium, tristan, or pyridine, um, and also quantum dots. In the ground state, we can illuminate those with visible light, and we do like using visible light because that allows uh, you know much more practical applications in the laboratory. And following excitation, they generate a, a triplet excited state. And that triplet excited state is highly redox active. It can either uh, undergo a formal reduction or an oxidation with either an, a donor uh, or accept a molecule. In the case of uh, a formal reduction, uh, there is a, a donor which um, adds an electron into the catalyst system, generates this reduced ground state uh, catalyst, which is highly reducing, and then we can uh, then reduce substrates uh, to generate these radical intermediates, and then these radical intermediates can induce subsequent chemistries. Of course, they can also uh, do it oxidatively in a similar fashion. Again, the flow of electrons is in the opposite direction, again, to generate a formal oxidation process and return the catalyst to its ground state. And it, keep, and it keeps doing this over and over again uh, to, to fashion new reactions. Now, I just want to focus a little bit on this reductive quench cycle because many substrates in organic chemistry uh, which generate carbon-centered radicals generally rely on a reduction. So here is, uh, an, uh, I guess, a continuum of redox potentials and the various substrates which can be reduced to generate carbon-centered radicals. And these carbon-centered radicals can be either sp2 hybridized or sp3 SP hybridized and then undergo reactions. So the one of the uh, limitations with photoreductive catalysis has been that the redox potentials of these commonly available photoreductive catalysis means that we can only address a small window of uh, substrates to reduce uh, by one electron reductions. And you can see here some representations of these catalysts and, and the operating window in terms of the reduction potentials. And generally, uh, you know more than, than minus two is a very difficult uh, redox potential to address for the substrates that you wish to reduce. If we look at more interesting and more useful substrates, uh, such as these olefins and with the reduction of A-rings in birch type reductions, again, these are out of scope, out of the operational window of redox catalysis that are commonly available. And the reason for this uh, sort of stems from the energy of blue photons or visible photons, which are required to uh, excite these, photoexcite these catalysts. In general, the uh, redox potential or the energy that's available from photons uh, doesn't extend beyond about 2.8 volts. Um, however, due to um, photophysical processes, there is a significant reduction of those photons in translating that photon energy to electrochemical energy. And in general, it gets to about half the energy that's required, uh, that's, that's originally available in a photon and translates to the chemical energy of each one of these uh, photocatalysts. So that means that, uh, you know, interesting and useful redox potentials that are correspond to these dissolving metals are sort of out of scope of many of these photocatalysts uh, and um, necessary to be able to engage these uh, useful substrates such as olefins and aromatic rings. However, what we discovered in 2018 is that we were looking effectively at the reduction of imines to the corresponding amino uh, compounds uh, using a formal transfer hydrogenation presence of this iridium butyl uh, uh, substituted iridium catalyst. And what we noticed that in the presence of triethylamine, which is the uh, hydrogenation source in this uh, in this reaction. But there's a mismatch in the redox potentials of the catalyst substrate. So you notice here that the redox potential of the reduced state catalyst is minus 1.47 uh, volts. However, the reduction potential of this imine is minus 2.18 volts. So if you do the calculations, spontaneous electron transfer shouldn't occur. And this really caught our attention, and we wanted to examine this reaction further. So we decided to look at this chemistry a little bit further. And what we found was that um, the catalyst itself underwent these significant changes, structural changes, which allowed it to um, undergo or, or reach redox potentials to, to reduce uh, the imine. And I'll just talk you through some of these uh, changes that we observed. So if we take the ground state photocatalyst shown in the top left-hand side here, 
And we excite this with a blue photon, we generate the triplet excited state catalyst here. This triplet excited state catalyst can then undergo um, reduction uh, in the presence of triethylamine to generate the radical anion. So it's a metal to ligand charge transfer event which occurs here to generate this radical anion. Now, in the presence of the triethylamine radical cation, what we saw is sequential proton and electron transfer to generate the semi-saturated ancillary ligand here, which we characterise with NMR mass spec and also HPLC analysis. It's this reduced uh, ligand uh, adduct, what we call iridium-2, can, can undergo a second excitation uh, to generate this excited state, which we call iridium-2 star, uh, and this has a redox potential of around about minus three volts. So you can see that in situ, generating this, uh, this uh, highly reducing iridium excited state uh, can open up mini chemistry without having to do any modification to the catalyst. And this is all done in situ in one singular process. So we were excited by this discovery and wanted to, uh, to use this uh, to, uh, to look at this a little bit further. But before doing that, we wanted to examine uh, a little bit more about the photophysical uh, characteristics of this iridium catalyst. And what we found that it has a very long-lived uh, excited state, so about 2.2 microseconds, which in the world of photocatalysis is actually quite long. And that opens up many opportunities to do further downstream react, uh, reactions with this catalyst. And it was characterised by uh, an emission. So here we're looking at uh, effectively the emission of the, uh, the first uh, unmodified catalyst and also the second reduced state catalyst. So you can see that the emission here um, corresponds to a wavelength of about uh, 580 nanometers, uh, but the emission for the reduced state catalyst uh, involves a hypsochromal shift uh, with this type of characteristic, which indicates that it has a triplet excited state character. So satisfied, so looking, um, so satisfied that we had characterized this uh, um, I guess this unusual behaviour of this iridium uh, photocatalyst, we wanted to do some, uh, some further chemistry with this and see whether we could engage some you know, difficult to reduce substrates. Now, before we do that, uh, this was the, uh, the catalytic cycle that we proposed that this, uh, the, the, so catalytic, this reaction was actually operating in. So we start with the grand state catalyst that undergoes a uh, excitation uh, to this triplet excited state catalyst in the presence of a um, tertiary amine, uh, it generates the reduced state catalyst, which will undergo sequential proton uh, and electron transfer to generate the reduced state catalyst here. And as I mentioned before on the previous uh, slide, with the reduced ancillary ligand, uh, allows it to undergo a second excitation to generate the highly reducing uh, system just shown uh, here in the, in the brackets. Uh, the Second excited state can then undergo subsequent electron transfer with, uh, with substrates, which we interrogated, and I'll show you that in the next slide. So we looked at uh, some generally difficult to reduce substrates, and we looked at some um, organohalides, which ordinarily could not be reduced by the photocatalyst based on uh, the original um, uh, electrochemical behaviour that was characterised some time ago. But you can see just here, and I won't go through all of them, but we can actually uh, reduce um, substrates such as aryl chlorides, aryl iodides, alkyl bromides, and also alkyl iodides. So there's quite a diverse range of reductions that the catalyst can, can foster, opening up some new chemistries that we're really keen to for. And the reaction that we're interested in developing uh, was around amidation. And of course, there's no um, you know, need to sort of go through the importance of the amide bond. If you look at uh, the amide bond in nature and also in peptide chemistry, and, and, and Larry did a fantastic job in introducing the importance of the amide bond. But you can see that it's actually used quite heavily, particularly in drug discovery, as uh, one of the premier functional groups in making new molecules. And in fact, it's also one of the most highly used reactions, in, particularly with the pharmaceutical industry in developing new, uh, new molecules for, for biological screening. But there are some challenges. Concurrent, uh, currently, um, the uh, formation of AMO bonds involves the activation of carboxylic acids using traditional coupling CDC here. These are used uh, super stoichiometrically, uh, and of course, that generates a lot of waste and some and toxic byproducts. And that becomes really problematic, especially when uh, scaling up these reactions. 
So there's been a push uh, over quite a number of years to develop catalytic amide bonding some moderate success with, with developing that. However, there's still like quite a number of implications. One of the key advances has been around uh, catalytic carbonylation reactions, which involve the transmission transition metal catalyzed carbonylation of organohalides or organocerohalides with carbon monoxide in the presence of amine to generate the amine product. But there are some difficulties with this reaction as well. It's, uh, you know, it has to require forcing conditions, Owing to the difficulty of um, oxidative addition uh, with transition metals such as palladium to the uh, organohalide uh, bond. So, um, and, and also when using uh, saturated substrates, there also there's the uh, problem of beta hydride elimination too. So, this has proved to be quite an elusive uh, reaction, but one uh, which has uh, gained some developments over the last couple of years and what we thought that we could actually address. So one of the ways we thought about doing this reaction was via a radical carbon um, in, in a multi-component fashion. And the thought that we had was that you could take any organohalide as a feedstock, undergo a single um, uh, electron transfer to generate a carbon centered radical, and in the presence of carbon monoxide, we'll generate this acyl radical. And in the presence of an amine, we expect to generate amides. However, if you, um, if you uh, replace the amine with other substrate, you could generate a whole series of really interesting useful valuable products including ketones, esters and aldehydes. Now there, are, there has been some precedents around this. Um, back in 1991, uh, the Rayo group uh, demonstrated that you could take uh, alkyl iodides, presence of some traditional radical chemistry, so some stanones and, a, and an AIBN initiator, in the presence of quite high um, carbon monoxide concentration at 80 bar, you could furnish these asymmetric ketones. Um, similarly, some more modern reactions of this type of multi-component reaction were demonstrated by Yukopi von Wangelin and Jao in 2015, in which they could take a photoredox approach, in the again in the presence of um, uh, carbon monoxide at higher pressures, and they could take these, they could take these diazonium salts and, uh, cut and, and generate uh, both the uh, aldehydes and also sorry, the ketones and the carboxylic acids presence of these coupling reactions. We also developed a, uh, a carbonylating reaction uh, using diazonium salts and addressed some applications that were shown by von Wengel and Jao and do this in a continuous flow fashion in which we could take this iridium photocatalyst and reduce the constant uh, the pressure of carbon monoxide to about 25 bar to generate this dihydrobenzene. But our work was really limited to, to um, diazonium salts uh, because the catalyst under these conditions uh, could not engage single electron transfer to the corresponding iodides or bromides. And this was because the redox potential uh, is redox potential of the organohalides is outside the scope of the redox potential of the of the catalyst under these conditions. So we're interested in, in using uh, the uh, tandem photo redox catalysis system which we discovered and applying this to um, organohalides to generate an amide bond. So effectively, we wanted to take the highly reducing uh, iridium-2 photocatalyst, which we can generate in situ in the presence of, um, uh, of a tri-alkyl ammonium base, generate the corresponding alkyl radical, trap it with carbon monoxide, and uh, the acyl radical could then be intercepted with an amine to generate the amine product. And this could all be done at room temperature, and we're hoping to address both um, uh, aryl halides and also alkyl halides in this reaction design. So being a flow chemistry group, what we want to do is establish a flow chemistry platform which will allow us to do this. And there were two reasons for doing this. The first one is that we could introduce carbon monoxide uh, in a flow chemistry system uh, in a much safer fashion, in a much more controllable fashion that you could batch. And we could do this, this with, a, with a membrane reactor technology, which I'll go through in the next slide and we can control the concentration and therefore the uh, delivery of carbon monoxide very um, controllably in this fashion. We also wanted to use a photochemical flow reactor to allow the transmission of light across the reaction and that makes it much more efficient and therefore faster. Uh, and uh, we wanted to do this again in a way that would uh, be much safer and much more practical in the laboratory. And here's a typical reaction setup that we have in our lab. You can see the carbon monoxide cylinder 
shown here in the yellow. Uh, we use commercially available and also bespoke uh, flow chemistry apparatus, and you can see the pumps uh, and, and the control shown here at the front. We pass it through our membrane reactor and our bespoke photochemical reactor shown just here. We tend to develop our own uh, photoreactor systems, and you can see here we've taken LED arrays, and we've mounted those into a couple of heat sinks, and we use a computer fan to draw out the heat, and we wrap around the tubing uh, uh, against the support, and we can flow our reactions in and out that are irradiated, irradiated in this section, and then collected down uh, in this box just shown just here. If we need more photons, we use uh, these Kessel lamps, which uh, add more um, uh, wattage to, to the reactor to, to achieve high uh, rates of illumination. The, the reactor that we use was the one originally developed by Steve Langley's group, and that uses a concentric, concentric tubular design in which a liquid is flown through a membrane that is Teflon AF2400, and that membrane is permeable to gases but not to liquid. And this allows us then to pressurise another tube in which the gas can be um, delivered through the, the membrane and then pass that through to the reactor system, in this case, the, uh, the photochemical reactor. So this is a really nice way to be able to control the delivery of the reactor. This is a very small the delivery of the gases in the reactor. It's a very small volume, so there's about 30 mil or, or less of gas at any one time. So if there was a um, compromise or a burst of the or rupture of the tubing, uh, there is no amount, uh, there's no appreciable amounts of carbon monoxide in the lab at any time. So this was a really safe way to do that. So having developed the reaction, uh, we effectively arrived to um, these sets of conditions I've shown just up the top here, where we can have a pumping of acetonitrile, which is the solvent used for this reaction. We use a sample loop, we use our reactor a pressurizer 35 bar, we have a 1.5 mil reactor with a photo um, where it's illuminated with 50 or 54 watt blue LEDs and we use a back pressure regulator to pressurise the entire system to allow for more precise pumping. Uh, we use Dipere as the base uh, and the iridium catalyst about one uh, mole percent. Now, we looked at the amidation with morpholine and carbon monoxide and a range of barrel halides. I won't go into too much detail, um, but you can see that this reaction does tolerate both uh, um, iodides, bromides and chlorides, although chlorides are somewhat more sluggish than we um, would like, uh, but it's still possible to, to address halides, uh, all, all of those halides from aerine sources. And you can see there is some chemoselectivity, such as this boronic ester, uh, and it also tolerates uh, heteroatoms as well. Uh, we could also then um, screen the different types of amines, so we can add more diversity in the types of uh, amides that we can generate using the procedure. So here we have a bromobenzene, uh, and again tolerates both cyclic amines, open chain amines, primary, secondary, and also uh, tertiary, alpha tertiary adducts. Interestingly, when we uh, were using allylamine, again, you can see there was no reduction of the double bond here. Again, showing that the chemoselectivity um, from, from this type of reaction and also being able to do that in flow. One thing that I should also mention is that this reaction is over in about 15 minutes. So uh, it's a very quick reaction and a very efficient reaction. Uh, following on from that, we also looked at um, alkyl halides, and in this case, we'll look at uh, alkyl iodides, and we looked at the um, amino carbonylation uh, of various uh, primary, secondary, tertiary um, uh, derivatives. And again, these are all furnished very smoothly in the reaction. Uh, we could also look at more complex products, and we looked at the iodo cholesterol just here, uh, where we're carbonyling at this point. Again, diversification with the range of amides uh, worked quite well, and it shows that we can build complexity fairly quickly. What it didn't do very well it was um, handle alkyl bromides. And this was because of the redox potential of the bromides, also the very slow reaction of, the, uh, of those substrates to be able to generate the corresponding alcohol radical. So that was a limitation of the work. We did have to change the conditions a little bit here in which we uh, had a residence time, so a radiation time of about 20 minutes. Uh, we did, however, reduce the corresponding pressure of the carbon monoxide. Um, we could also look at uh, different uh, types of amines, so both aliphatic and aromatic amines. I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, but again, the take home message is that there is significant diversity in this type of reactivity. Uh, we could also have very congested amines uh, and also amines which was uh, a, a potential to reduce 
other functional groups on the uh, on the substrates such as the iodine or the chlorine or the bromine, but these won't reduce we have simply got uh, reduction of the corresponding up or iodide and carbonylation to furnish the amides. Uh, one important thing that we always try and do in our lab is demonstrate applicability and, and we do that by um, upscaling our reactions and it's, it's fine, it's one thing to be able to make these reactions for uh, subgram quantities, but most labs like to generate uh, gram quantities of material. So what we made was this piperazinamide here, which is valuable in many uh, drug intermediates on routes to their synthesis. Uh, and we used this uh, reaction set up here in which we used a, uh, a H regular HPLC pump. Uh, and we used two reactors in series and we monitored the reaction using this inline uh, and infrared, uh, infrared instrument. Uh, this has a flow cell, so the FTIR can monitor the, the reaction. And what we're able to do is generate uh, effectively five grams of this material uh, over a few hours without any, any um, significant modification to the original procedure. All right, so what I've shown you is that we could use this uh, new tandem photoredox method uh, or protocol that we discovered a couple of years ago to um, actively and efficiently generate amides. We showed that using a single photocatalyst, uh, we could generate 90 examples of diverse, uh, both uh, amines derived from uh, alkyl iodides and also from aryl iodides. We could also affect late stage uh, functionalization. And of course, being a flow chemistry process enables a practical and scalable process to, to undertake in the laboratory. Since then, we're generating, uh, we're really excited to be doing much more chemistry. Uh, and one example is this olefin hydroisolation, where we're generating ketones, uh, again, using this from uh, this acyl radical intermediate generated from the multi component process, uh, and we'll, re we'll, we'll be reporting on that shortly. So, with that, I think I've done gone well into my time. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our current group members. Um, former group members, our collaborators, and also John and his team for, for the kind invitation to present you today. I also have to acknowledge University of Melbourne, the CSIRO, which has been wonderful in their support uh, of these projects, our training centre and the ARC. That, thank you very much. Many thanks for that, Tash, and hopefully you've opened up a few people's eyes on different ideas on photocatalysis for them to perhaps implement in their lab or even reach out to you if they've got any any more ideas. Sure. You can see, um, in the chat we've got a question from um, Peter Tran. So mm -hmm. um, you have shown that the super reducing iridium species are capable of reducing organohalides. Have you tried reducing mm -hmm. other useful substrates such as alkenes or alkynes? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. That's that's a really good question. So we recently reported the single electron reduction of olefin, um, and that's worked really well. So we can reduce those, and we can also use the corresponding radical anion from those olefins to do subsequent chemistries. So we reported that earlier this year, and we've uh, since then we've we've been working on other substrates, uh, looking at things such as you know doing birch type reductions, generate some more some more interesting reactions. Perfect. We've got one more question, but um, we've got in the Q&A session, we've got a lot of questions coming through. So um, I think all of the speakers are able to reply on the chat. So we'll, we'll leave Giancarlo's question for the chat, um, just due to, due to time constraints. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Tash and Lara, for your great presentations. Really appreciate your time. And also to everyone on the call, appreciate the time spent, obviously, on the webinar now that now that labs are reopened, I'm sure that everyone's dying to do experiments, but we're really appreciative of the time you're spending to watch this webinar. And next up is, um, we've got Philip speaking next. Thank you, Justin. Um, just bear with me one moment. I'll everyone able to see my screen? Looks good. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Justin, for that introduction. Um, I'd like to begin today by joining Tash and Lara in thanking John and uh, his team on uh, the Merck organization, of course, for giving me the opportunity today to present to you some of the work that we've been doing in our laboratories over the last few years. Um, I'll just go to, I don't have a laser pointer 
on my version, unfortunately. But uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, begin by giving you a quick overview of some of the chemistry that we pursue in our in our group uh, before moving on to uh, sharing with you some of one particular project with, that we finished this year in a little bit more detail. So we're a organic synthesis group and our main aim is to discover new reaction chemistry uh, through the power of catalysis, homogeneous catalysis. And we're involved, um, we hope to achieve this in uh, four different ways. The first one is through organic organocatalysis and it's great to see that this year the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for uh, organic catalysis to Professor uh, ben List and Dave McMullen, a well-deserved um, award to their contributions to the field. Uh, in my group, we're specifically uh, focused on using Bronsted acid catalysis as a means to develop uh, asymmetric reactions. And an example I've given here is, a, is a, of a recent work that we had finished uh, a couple of years ago now, where we were able to show RL vinyl alcohols of the type shown here can undergo dehydrated Nazarov type cyclization reactions, which had been previously reported for the last 50 plus years uh, to be uh, not doable in a, an answer selective manner. We're shown that we can actually be able to achieve that by a judicious choice of uh, bronze acid catalyst and reaction conditions. Um, we're able then to access the corresponding indium products in, up to, in yields and answer selective values of up to 95%. And we were able to achieve this by exploiting um, hydrogen bonding and ion pairing interactions in the, uh, what we think is the transition state in these reactions. We've also been actively engaged in alkane, alkyne activation chemistry, uh, and particularly with the group 11 metals, um, and I have to be honest with you, primarily with, with gold, where we uh, wanted to see if we can uh, in rapidly increase molecular complexity from acyclic substrates of the type shown here, and uh, be able to access uh, what we hope to be uh, typically useful compounds for biological materials applications. And of course, along the way, I should have mentioned this for the constant acid catalysis chemistry as well, develop uh, synthetic tools to the wider synthetic community that they might find useful. In the example I've shown here, we were able to show for the first time in gold catalysis, the ability to form the eight member ring system uh, in this adduct shown here, directly from an eight endo uh, dig cyclization pathway through this, uh, what we believe to be this uh, reactive intermediate shown. We also are uh, very much interested, like uh, Tash uh, and his group, in uh, stage one functionalization chemistry. This is, and this is an example of that from a, a few years ago now, where we are able to show that you could formally azurinate across a carbon carbon single bond in the presence of a copper two catalyst, and this ammonia dane as our nitrine source, where we uh, had proposed. The involvement of this uh, cuprate uh, intermediate that undergoes uh, reductive elimination and also um, cyclization, deaminative cyclization to get to our ZD product. More recently, uh, we've also dipped our toes into the field of photocatalysis, and as you saw, some of the excellent work that was presented by Tash in the pre previous presentation. Uh, he has certainly set a high bar for the rest of the Australian synthesis community to follow, I dare, mention, I dare say. Uh, this is a, a very recent work that we've just completed. It's our, only our second uh, study in the field where we looked at the Minisky alkylation reaction and we asked ourselves the question, can we do the Minisky alkylation reaction Without the need of a um, metal, uh, without the need of a metal uh, photocatalyst, 
Uh, in other words, can we do it or, with an organic catalyst to generate the radical that adds to our petra, irene substrate? And indeed, we were able to uh, able to do that by exploiting the possibility of the Hansch ester and this uh, uh, thalidomide ester here to uh, form an EDA complex and a electron donor complex in situ that then uh, rapidly decomposes on exposure to blue LED light to form the radical species here that adds to our heterene. And we showed that if you do do this reaction in the presence of a chiral acid, you can also introduce an ester selective T in these reactions in yield in with E values up to 99%. We've also been very fortunate in that a lot of the reaction chemistry that we've developed over the years has, uh, through collaborations with uh, biochemists here in Australia and also overseas to have uh, be shown to have biological activity, whether it be uh, potent anti-inflammatory activity or as potential treatments for leukemia or prostate cancer. There's a disclaimer I, I like to make here, and it's that you see a lot of nice, pretty uh, pictures here. Unfortunately, I can't add any of those. Those were uh, generated by my collaborators, but they look nice, and I thought I would include them with the, the, the chemistry uh, in, this, in these slides. So um, I'd like to finish today's my, uh, presentation by sharing with you a project that we finished this year uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, and this project is is in our is part of our interest in CH bond functionalization chemistry, and it really came about um, from another project that we were looking at. Where uh, at the time we thought uh, we wanted to make uh, a chlorinated substrate, and we wrongly thought at the time would be would be quite straightforward and easy to make, but when we looked into the literature, as it turned out, that was not to be the case. And in actual fact, whilst there is indeed an awful lot of methods how to uh, chlorinate an aromatic ring, or indeed at the alpha position to an aromatic ring, what we found was that there were very limited examples of chlorinating at uh, a alpha position to a carbon-carbon double bond, for example, without the transposition of that carbon-carbon double bond. And even less so when it came to unactivated carbon centers of alkanes, whether it be at a tertiary center of an, of an alkane or at a secondary center of an alkane. There's also some really nice reviews that cover this, this field, but there was what really pricked our interest was that there was this real uh, lack of uh, methodology to do such chlorination at, as I mentioned, that these uh, carbon centers of enones and alkanes. And indeed, if you look into the literature in a, in a little bit more detail, you'll find that uh, there are, of the known methods to, to do chlorination, uh, there are some real limitations. Uh, there's this work here by the Alexandria Group uh, in 2016 that showed that whilst indeed you can do site-selective chlorination at the delta site, using this uh, rather uh, unique uh, chloroamide uh, chlorinating reagent, the, the selectivities aren't actually that great. Uh, there is preferential selectivity at the delta position, but you also get, get that with a mixture of the alpha, beta, and gamma substituted adducts. A more recent example is by the uh, Groves group, and, and again, here, whilst they were able to show selectivity at the gamma position with greater selectivity, unfortunately, this method was only limited to cyclic alkane substrates, uh, esters, uh, cyclic ester alkane substrates, uh, using the manganese porphyrin uh, catalytic system. So, this to us posed a, a, a quite an interesting challenge and 
something that we, we asked whether or not we could uh, possibly contribute and uh, address to uh, and provide a, a possible synthetic solution. And when we were looking at this problem, there was a, another uh, paper that we also uh, came across that really pricked our interest into uh, coming up with a, a possible solution. And that is this uh, 1993 tetrahedron lattice paper by the uh, group of uh, Dubai, Dubai uh, from the Defense Research and Development Establishment in India. So they showed dichloramine in T, which we often associate as an aminating reagent, could uh, chlorinate, could chlorinate uh, uh, mustard, uh, such as the, the, the file shown here. And in doing so, they proposed a mechanism where this chloramine T radical was generated, and uh, along with uh, the, the chlorinated sulfur centered radical species here, which then uh, rapidly decomposed to form the more stable dichlorinated atom, compound seven here, uh, which underwent elimination to give the chloroalkene and the uh, sulfonamide shown here. So we thought maybe we can adapt uh, some of this uh, chemistry to um, doing site-selected uh, alkane chlorination chemistry. And indeed, uh, we were really fortunate in, in that when we, when we tested this theory out, uh, we were able to achieve that and led us to this work that uh, I'd like to sh uh, share with you in a little bit more detail, where we found that alkyl benzenes selectively chlorinated at the alpha position, something that we, we kind of expected given literature crescents. But we also found uh, ketones containing a secondary uh, CH center at the gamma position or tertiary center at the gamma position, and also enones at the tertiary, at, the, at this gamma position, selectively chlorinated to give the corresponding chlorinated product shown here without uh, other uh, chlorinated adducts um, being, being generated at the same time. Uh, I won't go through the, the scope in, in too much detail, but just to say that uh, we were pleased to, sh uh, to find that our methodology was um, quite applicable to a variety of uh, ketone substrates with different substitution patterns uh, containing a tertiary carbon center, but also uh, with a secondary carbon center shown here in these two examples bottom. And we were able to achieve moderate to good yields, so anywhere between 40 to 80 plus percent yield. And we were also able to uh, show that uh, this methodology was not limited to ketones and in actual fact esters and also amides were applicable containing a, a quarter, quarter sorry, containing a tertiary center but unfortunately the only example that did not work was uh, an ester containing a secondary example uh, sorry containing a secondary carbon center uh, and likewise we were able to show that uh, enones chlorinated well in moderate to good yields, anywhere between 30 or up to 80% yield. And also a variety of alkyl benzenes worked really well, and we could scale it up to the gram scale level uh, quite easily. So if we started off with this example here, for example, we were able to make this in 1.1 gram and then convert it to a, uh, a known uh, uh, drug in in this compound shown here. What was also very pleasing was that we were able to do late stage, late stage uh, modification of a variety of uh, natural product derivatives, uh, as shown on this slide here. So whether it would be the uh, four methyl uh, valerate pyridine molecule here, to this uh, celesterolide molecule, we were able to selectively chlorinate at the, at the alpha position of this natural product to our benzene ring, or previous example at the gamma position here as well. 
So mechanistically, what we uh, what we believe is happening in, the, in these transformations is that we are generating a uh, an active. So we start off with our copper copper one triplet, and we are ge generating the solvated version of our copper catalyst, where two molecules of our acetonitrile uh, coordinate to our copper. Uh, and as a consequence of this uh, solvation, this uh, solvated copper uh, species can then interact with that molecule dichloramine in T and undergo a, a set oxidation pathway where we first well, first of all form this copper 2 diradical species, which then is very prone to uh, for migration of one of the chlorine atoms to the copper center. Uh, this is this then becomes susceptible to um, a, re a rearrangement at the copper center here to give us uh, this trivalent copper two species, which then can then coordinate to a triple A anion to give the more stable tetravalent copper two species here. At the same time, we are generating our chloroamine D radical species that you may recall from the tetrahedral lattice paper uh, that was reported in uh, 1990. Three. And this uh, chloramine T uh, radical species is then able to extract a hydrogen from our substrate, whether it be our ketone or our alkyl benzene, to form the corresponding alkyl radical species here. Now, this radical, this radical uh, alkyl species can do one or two things. It, if R here is derived from the ketone, this makes it a really potent reductant. And so um, conversion to the, its interaction with our copper two uh, species here and to the high and copper three species is not gonna be uh, favorable. And in actual fact, what, what might happen instead is that it forms this, it reduces this copper one reduces the copper two species, uh, sorry, to the copper one species down here. And upon uh, coupling between the, uh, what we think is uh, the THF uh, cyclic adapt that is formed from our uh, ketone radical and our uh, chloride here, with uh, the consequence form our chlorinated ketone product here with the copper catalyst being regenerated. And this is an, an atmosphere uh, pathway. On the other hand, when our, our radical, where R here is now an alkyl benzene, this is a, a much uh, less potent reductant, and so therefore it can react with our copper two species, copper two complex here to form a high oxidation state three, three, copper three complex shown here which can then undergo reductive elimination to give our alpha chlorinated benzene product shown here, and of course, regeneration of our copper catalyst. In terms of supporting this mechanism, we've done quite a number of control experiments where we, in one of the first ones we, we undertook was to show that uh, this is likely to be a radical pathway by, uh, in, by repeating our reactions in the presence of either tempo or BHT and showing that there was no transformation. And also doing a radical clock experiment with this cyclopropyl derivative here and showing that the uh, diene uh, is, is preferentially formed. Unfortunately, we couldn't isolate this. It's, uh, it was uh, too reactive and readily decomposed upon column chromatography, but we were able to detect it by uh, HRMF. H RMS analysis. We were also able to show that uh, the ketone functionality, uh, the carbonyl functionality was really important in these chlorination reactions, and that it, it was not a bond dissociation energy, energy of, a, of a tertiary carbon center here that was um, the overriding factor in these transformations. By just simply making uh, the truncated version of our ketone adduct and showing that uh, no chlorination uh, uh, could occur as a consequence of that. And likewise, uh, 
knocking out the ketone functionality altogether in these two examples here, and again showing that in both instances no reaction was observed. And in actual fact, for this particular substrate here, only alpha chlorination to our to our phenyl ring uh, was observed to give a chlorinated product here in 70% yield. And we were also able to show uh, through a deuterium labeling experiment that um, the possibility of a of a one three hydrogen radical shift was was probably not operative in our reactions by making this uh, deuterated ketone and I've shown here and shown when, that when we subject it to our chlorinating reagents, there are there is no scrambling of, of that signal, which uh, was in, in good agreement with some earlier works by the Randon group showing uh, in carboxylic acids the alpha positions uh, and the beta positions of those carboxylic acids are somewhat deactivated due to polar effects. And finally, in two final sets of control experiments, we, should, we were able to somewhat delineate the fact that um, there's a, probably a lot more going on in these trans transformations than what we uh, were able to, um, to reveal so far. When we did some um, uh, kinetic isotope experiments, we've, we got kinetic isotope uh, values, KIV values of uh, 5.8 and above which kind of suggested to us that there's probably some quantum mechanical uh, tunneling effects in this transformation, but this is something that is still in the investigation and we are yet to really pin down as to what those uh, quantum mechanical uh, tunneling effects are. But the one thing that we were uh, able to support was the formation of our copper two chlorinating uh, complex uh, was very likely to be involved in these transformations by just taking this um, a, an ecumolar equivalent of our uh, copper one triflate with dichloramine T and being able to show that we can uh, detect that complex, the desolvated uh, adduct of that complex by um, a spectrometry. Uh, we could see a very nice peak at 247, uh, which corresponded to that uh, couple ones. Uh, sorry, that copper two species. And likewise, we were able to back this up by look, uh, looking at how that complex, uh, in the absence of the substrate, just simply decomposed back to total chloride. That's uh, uh, the reaction conditions. Uh, I think on that note, uh, I'd like to finish off by thanking my group for um, some of the chemistry that I've shown you today. Uh, it's all the chemistry I've shown you today and actual facts done by them. Uh, fortunately, I'm not in the lab anymore doing these experiments. And in particular, I would like to find, find two former members, uh, Jingwen and Yi Chao. They, uh, they are here in this photo. So Jingwen and uh, Yi Chao, they were, they were the two people uh, responsible for the uh, copper, chlorination, copper chlorination chemistry I've just shown you. I also like to thank the Australian Research Council and Monash University for funding. Of course, uh, you for uh, your attention. Thank you. Many thanks, but Philip, Professor Philip, it was very comprehensive. We've got, I think, two questions in the chat. So the first one for you um, from Giancarlo, who's been very popular today with questions. Thanks, Giancarlo. In your chlorination reaction, have you tried to use only an appropriate chlorinated copper complex instead of the system, the TSNCl2CuOTF? Yeah, that's a really good question. The answer to that is yes. Um, but the key here is the is the form the is the form the nitrogen centered radical. Um, but it's a very very difficult radical to form. And, um, we tried a, quite a number of combinations, but uh, as it turned out, the dichloramine T. Um, um, the copper triflate combination happened to be the, the be the best one. Some of the combinations did work, but not 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 as well. All right, and the, the last question actually in your section um, is from Bernice. So she's interested to know what evidence you have to support a pathway 
involving a cyclic. Um, I've lost part of the screen. Species, <laughs> yes. Um, cyclic eat the species uh, for the ketone chlorination mechanism that you proposed. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't able uh, with uh, the fact that there was a 20-minute presentation. I wasn't. Uh, I was wasn't able to show you this some DFT calculations that we did to underpin uh, experimental uh, mechanistic studies that we we had undertaken. And uh, but from the DFT calculations, we were able to show that indeed radical formation does occur in the first instance at the uh, gamma position, but as it turned out, based on DFT calculations, the cyclic ether was around about six kilo, uh, kilocal uh, per mole, so six kilojoules per mole, I should say, uh, more stable than it's a, a cyclic radical form. Perfect. Thanks so much for that. I think we've got some slides just to um, wrap things up. So thanks everyone for your time. I think we've gone slightly over time, but um, all been very interesting topics. So I'm sure that we've all gained a lot um, from the extra five five minutes spent on the call. So John, if you'd like to, yeah, I, I thought I am sharing. Perfect. Yeah. So we've got an upcoming webinar um, on November the 10th, where Tash will feature again um, with a few different topics on um, green temp chemistry as well. So I think there's about five different speakers. So if anyone's interested in that topic, I think sustainability is becoming an important um, area for all of us to focus on. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat or we'll send a link to this, this next webinar if those, for those of you interested. And thanks Tash again for your double appointment with Merck. The next slide, and we'll, yeah, as I said, we will send a post event email. Um, so all of the, we've, we've recorded the session, we'll send you slide decks as well. And any, any questions that are still remaining, we'll make sure that, that we send to, to you guys directly as well. In terms of Merck support, so you've met John on the call and John mentioned um, Karen Duong as well. So we've got a team of Merck technical uh, field application specialists that are able to help you with demos, tech support or troubleshooting. So again, we'll provide contact details in a follow-up email, but yeah, always feel free to reach out if you need any extra support. Karen's our chemical specialist, and as you've seen through these these speakers, these presenters today, um, you know we're very connected with with the industry. Um, so yeah, no, no questions too big or too small. So always yeah, feel more than free to reach out to us. And we also have a um, a chemical journal as well that Sigma publishes called the Acta. The um, yeah, so the Older Chemica Actor Journal. So if, if you do have any innovations that you would like us to consider for publication, we're also happy to um to consider that as well. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Um, I just want to say thank you to the, our three speakers today, um, Lara, Tash, and Philip. I really appreciate your time putting this together. Um, it is the pointy end of the season. Um, and the labs are open again, right? So everyone really wants to get in there and do some work. So we really appreciate the time you've put in to, to, to for, for this for this presentation. Um, to our attendees, thank you. We have run a little bit over time, but I'm sure you appreciate the enormity of the work that's gone into this. So thanks for hanging around and um, listening and, and asking the questions. Um, on your way out, we have a small survey. If you could please spend another couple of minutes for us uh, filling out the survey. It's really, again, it's a gift to us, you telling us what you think of what we've put together and how we can uh, put things together in the future for you um, for webinars. And hopefully one day next year, we can get together in person um, to put together uh, live sessions as well. So on behalf of Merck and the team, and on behalf of Lara, Philip and Tash, we again want to thank you all for um, turning up today. Uh, we bid you, it's not afternoon yet, but we bid you a good day and, and a great rest of the week for you. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you.